So in today's video, we're talking about terminal prostate cancer, where the prostate cancer has advanced and metastasized in the body and treatments are no longer controlling the disease. So we're talking to Dr. Mark Schultz, who's a 30 year medical oncologist focusing solely in prostate cancer. And he's gonna discuss his experience with this situation. So in today's video, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about prostate cancer patients who have advanced disease and their disease is no longer being controlled. For people in this situation, I think they're kind of wondering, did we get everything? Is there a checklist we should have looked over to make sure that there's nothing that we missed? And what do the next steps look like if treatments have not worked? So we're talking about patients who have widely metastatic disease, patients who've been on first and second generation hormones for extended periods of time. PSAs are rising. Patients who've been through some chemo, had pluvicto, undergone genetic testing, and if there were any treatments that could uh, induce responses because of the genetic profile, uh, had some form of immune therapy. If the disease is continuing to progress, uh, PSAs are rising, uh, scans are getting worse, is there a time where you, you say, really, uh, we're running out of options and, and uh, maybe it's time to pursue comfort measures. That time does come. I, I know there's, everyone wants to be very thorough and ensure that there's been uh, you know, no stone left unturned, that there's no uh, treatment option in the wing somewhere that uh, could be effective because that is the best way to bring about a better quality of life, reduce pain, and even maybe even live longer is if we can find another treatment. The pursuit of that is important. I think in, in the whole process leading up to that, the, uh, the sense of urgency of pursuing these things in a timely way, one of the th things that makes me sad is if I have patients who, because there was sort of a lackadaisical attitude towards implementing treatments in a timely fashion, that the disease gets out of control and there isn't time to give treatments that we know can help. The other limiting factor that comes in is that prostate cancer, when it gets very advanced, it spreads throughout the bone marrow and many of the chemotherapy type treatments or the radiation type treatments have a collateral impact on bone, bone marrow that can cause uh, blood counts to drop excessively uh, where someone may need transfusions or become susceptible to infections because their immune system isn't functioning appropriately. This sort of end stage situation that uh, and where patients can get bone marrow failure uh, also limits treatment options. That concept of keeping that in view, that there's a bone marrow uh, reserve that's adequate for patients to have treatment. And so that becomes a limiting factor. One of the uh, medicines, Zofigo, is a, a nice palliative treatment for people with bone metastasis. But if their bone marrow reserve is too weak, they can't take it. All these factors, I think, come into play when we talk about maybe it's time to go on hospice, maybe it's time to start comfort measures, uh, and uh, that people have peace of mind that they've really made a good effort to implement all available treatments and they're not leaving anything behind. I think one of the biggest concerns that comes from the patients and from caregivers who are in this situation is how they handle pain. So, you know, what does the pain management look like in this situation? If there's an effective treatment, that's the best way to control pain. But as we already pointed out, sometimes there are no remaining effective treatments that haven't already been tried. And if it's a, a, an area of bone pain, usually spot radiation can be very effective in getting rid of that pain. And then you're on to uh, things like uh, nerve blocks. They can um, uh, inject medicines to block nerves where if you have pain in a specific region. And uh, then the old tried and true are, are narcotic medications, which uh, can be uh, very effective in, um, in controlling pain. So this is uh, an area of expertise, pain management, pain control. There are actual physicians trained in simply uh, controlling pain, and if there's not adequate delivery of those services, uh, patients should look to get a consultation from a pain expert. Medical oncologists who do manage patients with uh, terminal diseases are usually pretty proficient in this sort of thing. Urologists who sometimes manage advanced prostate cancer, being surgeons, maybe not as much, but a, a medical oncologist or a pain specialist. And ultimately, if it's concluded that the treatments options are running out, then uh, hospice programs where you have trained nurses that uh, have been through this 
uh, this whole process many times and understand how these different pain medicines work and how to keep people comfortable are uh, very, very helpful. So in these situations where all treatment options have been explored and there is widespread metastatic activity, patients have sometimes asked, is it even worth going on a clinical trial in this state or is it too far gone? So what, at what point is the cancer so extensive that a clinical trial would not be effective in that time frame? The things that keep people out of clinical trials uh, and not every clinical trial is going to help a patient. Uh, patients do need to be selective and uh, get the backstory on these different medicines. It's not the trial that you want, but it's a, uh, access to a medicine that's not yet FDA approved. So you can do research on that medicine and find out if it's really likely to help or not. You don't want to be in a clinical trial unless there's some evidence that the medicine that's being researched has already done some good for some people that have prostate cancer. But the things that keep people out of clinical trials are um, Weak bone marrow, so if a person is very anemic and they can't get their red counts up above a certain level. Very low platelet counts, if they can't get their platelet counts up. If they have a history of other cancers that uh, have been active, maybe in remission, that will often exclude people from clinical trials. And then there's geographic issues of being able to travel on repeatedly to places. Doing background research on the possibility of getting onto a clinical trial is very important. When, if you talk to me that 10 years ago when the research on prostate cancer was a lot more anemic, um, I was not super enthusiastic about a clinical trial really making a big difference. But the, uh, we've talked on this uh, channel before about actinium, which is a very exciting, kind of a second generation Pluvicto type product. Uh, the immune treatments that are coming along now look very exciting. And if we aren't doing research uh, and uh, background searches to find out if there's a clinical trial, a new medicine that is hopeful, then I, we're really not doing our job. So I think that that is a very important component of this whole process of deciding we haven't really done our research if you haven't looked into clinical trials. So a big point of conversation in this channel is the timing of prostate cancer. And I think, you know, in the earlier stages of prostate cancer, we talk about how you have time and in advanced disease, you need to make those decisions a lot quicker. When you're at this point where there's widespread metastatic, you know, disease in the body, what does the timing look like as far as um, the treatments have stopped working and now we need to go into pain management and, and palliative care? I think it's very important that you make that contrast because uh, we're always telling people, slow down, do your research, don't jump into an irreversible treatment when we're discussing early stage disease. When patients have metastatic disease, it's more like trying to keep a burning fire under control. And I think the best counsel is for when things are going well, if someone is on a, say, chemotherapy, they've started their PSAs 100, they've gone on Taxotere, Jevtana, their PSAs dropped very nicely down to 20, maybe they've had four, five, or six treatments. During the time that they're on Jevtana, there should be an active search going on for what will be the next thing we do. And when people have advanced metastatic disease, we don't just uh, stop the treatment and see what happens. We know what's gonna happen. The disease will come back oftentimes briskly. The real question is, what are we going to switch to when we stop the Taxotere and Jeftana? So having a plan B at every step of the way until, as we've talked about in this uh, video, running out of options, there should always be a search in advance when things are going well uh, to know what the next step will be. I just wanted to give context for the patients that when we say that these treatments are no longer working, we've already done first generation and second generation hormone therapies, we've done chemotherapies, we've done Pluvicto, we've done Zofigo, and even you know some immune therapies that have been approved in other disease states, and the conversation about clinical trials. So it's not, I wanted to state this because there may be patients who have advanced disease who have not realized, like we're not talking about, okay, chemo's over and this is it. It's more a matter of there are different options in those categories, and as you also mentioned, actinium. So with that being said, is there anything that I'm missing within that context? The only clear cut, when we covered clinical trials, let's elaborate just a little more briefly on genetic testing. Genetic testing has become front and center because of PARP inhibitors and BRCA mutations. Uh, Patients, about 10% of men with advanced disease have these BRCA mutations, and if they go on a, a PARP inhibitor, which is a, a pill, a kind of a mild chemotherapy pill, response rates are very high. So it would be a terrible shame for someone not to get genetic testing and fail to discover that they're BRCA positive and that they are missing out on a potentially effective treatment. The other things that genetic testing can show 
are unusual mutations that have been detected uh, in prostate cancer patients, but are more common in other types of cancers, lung cancers, pancreas cancers. And the reason that's important is that the pharmaceutical industry has developed uh, targeted medications that address those types of mutations, and those may be effective if they're repurposed for prostate cancer. So there's basically two important reasons why genetic testing is uh, essential for patients with advanced disease. And I think we should be specific in mentioning what those are. Things like Garden360 testing, Foundation One testing, Keras has a new assay out, C-A-R-I-S, uh, which is just a blood test. And these blood tests can pick up circulating DNA in the bloodstream and look for mutations in that DNA and give some insight some, uh, and uh, some guidance in, as to what medicines might help that specific individual. So, you know, we've talked about in previous videos genetic testing in, you know, early stage disease versus advanced. At what point in the advanced stage should a patient get genetic testing? Is it when they have, you know, lymph node invasion or is it more like bone mets? Well, I think at the very latest, because it's never a problem with testing earlier, uh, but at the very latest it would be when someone starts to become hormone resistant. So, you know, at this point we're talking about patients who have, um, their diseases no longer respond to, you know, these different categories of treatments that we discussed. And you being a 30-year medical oncologist who's focused completely in prostate cancer, you have a practice that's only in prostate. And to my knowledge, you're treating about 2,000 patients actively. So how many patients are in this category where their disease is no longer controlled by any of the treatments and now they're kind of looking towards what's next? I would say on a general ongoing basis that we have two or three patients that are in this the status out of the 2,000 active patients that we, we actively track. We keep track of how many patients are uh, in, we have a membership program in our practice. About 20 patients a year go on and progress and die of, of uh, terminal prostate cancer out of our practice. Uh, many other patients die of other causes, old age, uh, you know, unrelated to prostate cancer, than die of prostate cancer. But the 20 or so patients each year that we lose uh, would be about 1% of the men that overall that we're managing with prostate cancer. And if you look at the stories of these men, they fall into basically two categories. Uh, some of these men were diagnosed back in the 1990s and uh, their disease slowly progressed over many years to where they're in this advanced stage and, and unfortunately they're going to uh, pass away from prostate cancer. And then there's another group of men that unfortunately never got PSA testing and were diagnosed with very advanced disease at the get-go. Those men can often be kept alive for 10 or more years, but if they were diagnosed, say, in 2007, now they're uh, facing problems with uh, running out of treatment options. You know, you have a practice that specializes specifically in prostate cancer. I think that other patients may not have access to clinics like yours where they're either specializing or maybe their medical oncologist is not mentioning all of the options. So what is the advice you would give them to patients who are in this category and advocating for themselves? We've mentioned uh, a list of options and that um, I think it behooves every patient to be very diligent. If, the, if hormone resistance is developing in men that have metastatic disease, then as I articulated already, we want always to be thinking of what will my next treatment be? And you have time if you're responding to, let's say someone becomes hormone resistant and they put you on Plavicto, which is an injection every six weeks for a total of six treatments. The Plavicto is working, the PSA is declining. During that time period, research should be ongoing, not only yourself, your family members, your caregivers, in terms of what would be the next logical step when the plavicto is stopped. It's not like after plavicto is stopped that you can just rest on your laurels. Some men do get long re remissions, but others, uh, once the plavicto is stopped, the disease will start progressing again. And it's certainly not wise to allow the disease to gain momentum uh, before initiating the next treatment. So for those of you who watch many of the PCRI videos, I know that this may come as a surprise that we're doing a video on palliative care. But our job here at the PCRI is to present every type of prostate cancer and to help walk you through what to expect, not just in treatments and early stage disease and in you know advanced disease, but also what the process of palliative care and terminal prostate cancer looks like. And I think that one of the biggest issues I see when it comes to this situation is that patients sometimes don't still advocate for themselves in this situation, or they're not talking about the pain that they're going through, or their medical team is not really working with them properly. 
So I would really encourage you, and we will go ahead and list out the treatments that Dr. Scholz mentioned and share videos on the topics that he mentioned there, because it is important to go through the different types of treatments, get that genetic testing, and see if something does work. And I have seen many times where patients have either maybe done a PARP inhibitor or something has worked through that process of you know finding out and going through that checklist of treatments. I think it is important that you talk about you know, this with your doctor and make sure you're advocating for yourself. And if he says, no, it's not an option, ask why. I think that why question and, and just challenging it a little bit of saying, okay, why is this not an option for me? I want to understand it. You want to have a medical team who is working with you and answering your questions. Another component of this is making sure that you're taking care of your emotional health and your mental health. And the more resources and the support that you can get, the better. So reach out to support groups because there have been many men who have been in this situation. They can talk about the treatments that they've gone through, but they could also just be there as a support system, as prostate cancer patients who are you know banded together through this experience and support you and support caregivers make sure you're reaching out to family make sure you're reaching out to us here at the PCRI at pcri.org forward slash helpline our helpline is um, really built to help people through this process and so it's important that you get the support you need I think that quality of life still matters greatly in this situation so please make sure that you're talking about any pain or discomfort that you have you know, all of this leads up to you being in as much comfort as possible through this process. And that is very, very important. You know, I really appreciate you watching this video. We appreciate that you trust us. We appreciate that you're, you're present and you're advocating for yourself and you're here. Please reach out if you need anything. You can reach us at pcri.org forward slash helpline or pcri.org for more information. I hope you have a great week and please remember, you're not alone.